night All is calm, all is bright Silent night, holy night Son of God, love's pure light Round the young virgin, mother and child Holy and feel so tender and mild It is my great joy to welcome you to another Kensington Christmas Eve. You are our joy. We've planned this service with you in mind completely. And if you have kids, I just want to remind you that we have a, some of you were able to get the Christmas kit for your kids with candles and hot chocolate, everything you need. If you weren't able to get one of these kits, please take a minute, run and grab some candles so that you can be a part of the Christmas lighting at the end of the service. So for me, you guys and kids that are out there listening, I want you to know that my favorite memory after all these years of Christmas is my dad reading the Christmas story on Christmas morning with our family. And that's what I want to do with you right now. I want to read to you the birth of Jesus Christ. This is how Jesus' birth came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be, jo to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her husband, was a good man, he did not want to disgrace her. 
he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Can you imagine that? And said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit and she'll give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel said. And he took Mary home as his wife, but had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And they called him Jesus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, magi, wise men, came from the east to Jerusalem and said, Where's the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star and we've come to worship him. But when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. He called together all the chief priests and teachers, said, where's this Christ to be born? They said, in Bethlehem in Judea. The old scripture was reminded, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah, you are no means least among the rulers of Judah, and out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly. He said, I found out the exact time that the stars appeared, and he had them go to Bethlehem. He said, go and make a careful search. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And after they heard this from the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where Jesus was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. They opened their treasures of gold, incense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to report back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Can you imagine these three guys taking this journey to find this person who would save us from our sins? Do you know what the greatest journey any of us can take, I think, is a journey to find Jesus. Because Jesus has been coming to find us all along. You know, it's funny to think back. 30 years ago today, we had our first Christmas Eve service. And we had it in a blizzard, in a foot of snow. All day, we, just, we debated whether or not to have the service. But people came anyway, a couple of hundred people. They stumbled in out of a foot of snow in the parking lot. And can you imagine the warmth and the foggy glasses as people came in to celebrate the warmth of Jesus' birth on that first Christmas Eve for us 30 years ago? I want to say to you, I hope you feel that warmth of coming home tonight with us. Some of you have been bruised and battered this year. It's been a tough year. But I want you to know as you come in, Jesus and his love and warmth is ready to welcome you. Merry Christmas. Come on in.
Well, hey, hopefully you guys are nice and cozy now. We thought it'd be really fun to do some uh, Christmas carols with you guys. So who's going to start that off? You know what? I think we should start off with a little bit of Santa Claus is coming to town. Coming to town, Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list and checking it twice. He's gonna find out who's naughty and nice. Santa Claus is coming to town, oh yeah. Santa Claus is coming to town. Santa Claus is coming to town. This one's for the kids of all ages, young and old. Sing it with us. Dashing through the snow In a one-horse open sleigh Over the fields we go Laughing all the way Bells on bobtails ring Making spirits bright What fun it is to ride with me we're going to sing the first noel the first noel the angel did say was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep no So this is Christmas And what have you done? Another year over And a new one just begun And so this is Christmas I hope you have fun the near and the dear ones, the old and the young. Have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Let's hope it's a good one without any Taking it back to a little bit of Motown, some Stevie Wonder, right? I like it. Someday at Christmas, men won't be boys Playing with bombs like kids play with toys One warm December, our hearts will see A world where there'll be peace Someday at Christmas, there'll be no wars When we have learned what Christmas is for When we have learned 
when life's really worse, there'll be peace on earth. Someday all our dreams will come to pass in a world when men are free. Maybe not for you or me, no, no, no. But someday at Christmas time. That's so good. That was a lot of fun, guys. Just thinking about the fact that we really haven't been in the same room at all this year, right? And with Christmas here, um, just thinking about being home for Christmas and just singing these songs together. I'm sure there's, you guys are thinking it too. There's just one song that comes to mind when we think about that. I'll be home for Christmas. You can count on have snow and mistletoe and presents under the tree Christmas Eve will find me where the love light gleams home for Christmas if only in my dreams I love that song so much. Yeah. What is it about I'll Be Home for Christmas that just strikes such a deep chord in so many people? I mean, I, I think so, about that song. Do you know that's been covered by over 700 different artists have recorded a version of that song? And what a powerful lyric. I'll be home for Christmas if only in my dreams. I mean, man, I, I don't know how that hit you, but man, every time I hear that, it strikes a deep chord. What is it about being home for Christmas? that is such a universal truth and such a universal ache in all of our hearts. I think about my own childhood, uh, growing up in New Jersey, and, and I, I have so many warm memories of what Christmas was like, and I loved every bit of it. I loved being with my family, and I couldn't imagine not being with my immediate family for Christmas. But have you ever had a time in your life, a season where you weren't able to make it home for Christmas? Something stopped you, prevented you, kept you, Maybe it's a pandemic. Maybe this is the first year that you are truly gonna be home alone for Christmas, away from family, and you're feeling the pain of that. I can tell you that in 1998, I was 22 years old, and I worked at that retail dinosaur, Circuit City, classic <laughs> place. 
And at Christmas, it was nuts. I was ringing sale after sale, but I needed to be out of there by noon that day because I had to drive from Scranton, Pennsylvania, yes, home of Dunder Mifflin and Michael Scott in the office, and I had to get to Cleveland, Ohio by about 8.30 or 9 for our family Christmas. My parents were there, my sisters were both there, everyone was waiting for me, and I needed to be on the road by no later than about two o'clock to make it there in time. As the day's going on, we're ringing up sales, racking up huge numbers, and I lost track of time completely. The only thing that tipped me off that something was wrong was I kept watching people leave <laughs> for the day that were supposed to close. Finally, I came to my senses, and I said, what time is it? Someone said, hey, it's four o'clock. I said, I gotta go to the mall and buy gifts still. So I ran next door to the Viewmont Mall, bought the gifts, and then uh, my parents had gotten a hold of me and said, hey, can you run to our house on Lake Wall and Paw Pack? Another office episode was there. And drive to their house, get this thing, and then drive six and a half to seven hours to Cleveland. So I finally got to my parents' house at about eight o'clock, grabbed what they needed, got my stuff together, and was walking out the door to my car, and it hit me. It's 8.30. I'm supposed to be in Cleveland in a half hour. And I was scheduled to work the day after Christmas at 7 a.m. I did the math. I'm like, there's no way. I, by the time I get there at three in the morning, sleep a few hours, have a couple hours with my family, I gotta drive straight back. I called my family and said, I can't believe I have to say this, but I, I can't come home for Christmas. And so after spending some time with them and they tried to encourage me, I hung up the phone and I just have to be honest with you, I've never felt so alone in my entire life. My parents' house was on the market. There was not one Christmas decoration anywhere. It might as well have been March in there. And I sat on the couch and I put in the VHS machine a tape of It's a Wonderful Life and watched that film. And as that movie's unfolding, as it gets to the end, when I grew up, every time it would get to the ending part where they say, to George Bailey, the richest man in town, something would well up inside of me and I'd have to leave the room and run to the bathroom just to control my emotion because I did not want to cry in front of my family. But this day I was completely alone, totally sad. And when it got to that part, to George Bailey, the richest man in town, I completely lost it. I cried so hard, I cried audibly, I bawled. It was just awful, the fluids and the sounds and everything else. I ran into that same bathroom and watched myself cry. I remember I have never felt so rock bottom alone in my life because you know what? I may have been in my house, but I was not home for Christmas, that ache and that longing. I still feel it to this day like it just happened. And when we think about that moment and we think about what that brings up, it really brings to mind why every human being has an ache in their heart. And that ache started at the beginning of our story as human beings. We believe in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, it teaches that God created man, man and woman, and placed us in a perfect home, in the Garden of Eden. Nature was perfect. Our relationship with animals was perfect. We're high-fiving grizzly bears and swimming with great white sharks, and there was no problem. Huh. My two greatest fears, by the way, right there. And, but something happened that disrupted this paradise because we had been able to walk with God in the cool of the day and have face-to-face -face conversations and have that sense of home. What happened was that we disobeyed. Humanity chose to rebel against God and disobey his clear directive. And because of that, we were thrown out of our perfect home and banned from going back in. And our story from that point on has been that desperate ache, that quest, that desire to get back home. And as years rolled by, and hundreds of years and thousands of years went by, we got to this point where the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, are being oppressed by the Roman Empire and they're being led by a puppet king by the name of Herod and they are crying out for a true king who would lead them home. And that's where we are in the Christmas story. And Jeremiah is gonna take us there in a moment. But before we do, Jeremiah, why don't you walk us through uh, our offering moment as we receive our offering today. Thanks Cliff so much for setting us up so well. We love this about the Christmas story too, is that it's a story that continues to be told thousands of years later, even now, and allows us to be on mission together. We know this has been a difficult year. And so we wanna tell you from the bottoms of our hearts, thank you for your generosity. So many have been giving sacrificially in such difficult times, uh, but it's all of you together that have given sacrificially that have allowed us to stay on mission together. And you are able to give even right now. And we wanna let you know that we have been able to meet so many needs from providing groceries to paying utility bills to helping people out in financial loss. Uh, even beyond that, from small groups that are taking 
virtual to online services to helping people, not just here, but all across the world, even now that human trafficking is being stopped because of your generosity. 500,000 plus people in Africa are finding fresh water and hearing the gospel, some of them for the first time ever because of your generosity. And so if you believe in the mission that God has invited us onto, uh, then please give. And thank you for being part of that. And thank you for your generosity. Today, we're picking up from, like Chris said, um, this guy named King Harry and a few other different people. In fact, we're gonna look at three characters and really three responses. And we want you to be part of this Christmas story uh, and to see the different way that people responded to the entrance of this king, to the entrance of Jesus into the world. And to get us moving that direction, we wanna read to you from Matthew chapter two, verses one through three, kind of reiterating what Steve Andrews had already shared to pick up in that spot. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Wow, just the opening part of that passage. Why was he so disturbed? Who are the Magi? Like, take us on a deeper dive. What's happening here in this Christmas story? Absolutely. Well, it's a story that we've heard so many different times. I mean, you've heard it from the Peanuts Christmas special <laughs> uh, to my childhood, reading it as a family. But we want to take a different look at this today. And we really want to key on these three characters. And, and this first part, I want to talk to you about the Magi. Who are the Magi? Uh, now, we sing these songs about we three kings and dropping off yeah. gifts. So we get this idea that it's three guys dressed like kings dropping off gifts. And, and historians and scholars and theologians believe that this incorrect assumption is probably based on the gifts. They just assume three gifts, three guys. But in truth, a Magi at this time in antiquity was a very important figure. This was not just some humble guy bringing a gift yeah. who just so happened to be looking at the stars. This was a very important role. And so Magi at this point, number one, uh, they were from the East. Most likely they believed these were Persian men, part of the Medo-Persian Empire, yeah. and that they were, they were very talented in studying the stars, both astronomy and then astrology, which was making predictions and prophecies based on, on astronomical events and phenomena. So they're looking at the stars. It was a very important thing. They were also very gifted in mathematics. They were known to be dream interpreters. Wow. These were very elevated guys in culture. In fact, there's numerous examples in Roman history, well-documented, of magi actually anointing and affirming new kings. Wow. And also, when they saw a star or some astronomical event, it typically signaled the death of one ruler and the birth of a new one. Wow. And so when we see the Magi into the story, they are studying the stars and they see this event happen. They see this star just appear, which is amazing because you're, you're thinking of this logically, like, well, how does a star just appear? Well, we did some work on this and in around 5 BC or so, which is right around the time that Jesus was born and before Herod the Great dies, is that there was a supernova that was recorded by Chinese astronomers, still can be found in their records, that a supernova event happened over the Middle East, which is the death of a star. And when a star dies, it gives off a very bright light for a season before it then burns out and goes away forever. Which I think is so interesting because where is this bright star but over King Herod, over where he lived, over his palace, over Jerusalem. In some ways, the stars were saying that this bright light, this king is burning out, and right now there is born a new king. And so the Magi, with all of their skills and all of their wealth and all of their prestige in that society and in that world, set out to find the star. But more importantly, they set out to find the king whose birth this dying star was announcing which is an amazing thought. So it wasn't just these three guys. You had a whole group of people. It was a large entourage. You would have soldiers and cavalry and, and horses and cooks and, and servants and others with them. When they arrived in town, it was a big deal. It makes sense why Jerusalem and Herod were disturbed. disturbed. 
because for a leader as paranoid as King Herod, which you're about to tell us in a couple minutes, to see the Magi arrive and talk about the birth of a new king, a paranoid leader like Herod is gonna take that to heart and be very disturbed, very bothered by it. And so here are these Magi, they're setting out and they are here. They've arrived now after a two year journey. They've arrived in Jerusalem where the star is kind of settled and they're like, where is the king who has been born? And Herod's response, I am the king. I am the king. So Jeremiah, take us deeper wow. into his response. So this is a big deal. Even in just a couple verses you had expounded, we begin to understand Herod's response is fear. Like Herod feared Jesus because your point, he had a lot to lose. You might say like, what did he have to lose? He was known as one of the wealthiest kings, right, in human history. He had so much to lose. This would be like Jeff Bezos losing everything for Amazon or, or Bill Gates, Gatesian wealth, right? This is a ton to lose. Not only this, he's also thinking that, oh my gosh, like he had found his way, you said a paranoid king, but also an oppressive king, a, a, an evil king. Like he had done major violent things to take the throne where he had. And now he's not even the rightful heir to this throne, but he's hearing the Magi are saying, who's this other king, king of the Jews that's coming, this guy named Jesus that's going to come in. I mean, this is big. Like for kids that are watching and families that watch The Lion King all the time, this is like Scar feeling a certain way when Simba comes back on the scene, right? That's the right. rightful king. And I'm not trying to equate Simba to Jesus here, but I'm saying like they're to get you know, understanding this is a big fear. This is like worried. And you might say, well, why is there so much emphasis on Herod? Why is he in this Christmas story? I think it's often because God put him there, placed him in the story so he can equate us to us. We can almost kind of see ourselves a little bit in Herod. And you may say, well, I've never like ordered the execution of my family, of course. Well, let me tell you something. I don't know about you, but I have been stressed. Cliff, what about you in this pandemic? I'm like, everything's from home, work from home, school from home, entertainment from home. Everything's from home right now. And so we can maybe relate that way a little bit from that stress, but not to that level. But where we can relate with Herod is this. He had all of his power and all of his strength tried to accumulate this kingdom. He had built this with his own proverbial hands, right? And now he has this fear of losing all of it. And you and I, when we've built something, it can be our sense of security, a sense of peace, a sense of our identity, right? And that's what's exactly going on for Herod. He's thinking, I'm going to lose my security, lose my peace, lose even my identity in this moment, which is why when Jesus comes on the scene for Herod and even us, when he comes on the scene for us and he says, look, it looks like you're losing control. Will you hand your life over to me? We freak out. We just do, we freak out in those moments. And here's the ironic thing. Here's the ironic thing about this character in the story and even for us in our life is that we never really have full control. It's an illusion. We always feel like we have control, but the reality is we're never truly in control. And that's where Herod is and that's where life will bring us to these moments. And yet his response is fear. He's worried Jesus is gonna come in and take everything away from him. But that's not the case. What we have to remember that's part of the Christmas story too is this, right? Even in the Gospel of Luke, that it says that do not be afraid. Herod's response is fear. The angel is telling him, don't be afraid because I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all mankind. Like this was gonna be promised to Herod as it was us too. And yet he responded in fear and didn't wanna let go of the power and control that he had, even though life was bringing him that place anyhow. I don't know about you, but for me, growing up, I look back to several years ago in my family and we grew up in a pretty, dysfunctional home at moments. But when I look back 10 years, we, everything had spun out of control for my mom, my dad, with alcohol and many things like that. And we lost all the control there, lost all the power. There was nothing they could do about it. And Jesus came in and what he brought really was good news. It was great joy because he brought the power of love, of healing and of joy and of reconciliation in our family. And he's radically changed everything. And I can't imagine this, Cliff, if we were to say no way like Herod, we're just like, I fear that. I don't want Jesus in my life. I don't wanna give up control. I don't wanna do that at all. We would have missed out on this. I would not be here speaking right now. Would not be doing that at all. And I'm telling you, the question is this, Herod feared Jesus and rejected him. For whatever divine reason, my family was able to accept Jesus and watch him radically transform our lives forever. The question is, what will you do when Jesus is knocking at your door, when you feel like you've lost control and you need hope and you need help Will you turn to him? There are three characters in this story that we're focusing on. We just talked about Herod. And next, Craig and Justin 
are going to talk about the next character in the story. Thank you, Cliff and Jeremiah, for walking us through the story of King Herod. And so Craig and I are gonna talk a little bit about the religious leaders. Now, these religious leaders were known for being experts in the law. They studied the law and they would know when the Messiah was coming. And so King Herod actually called them in to ask them about their opinion of this moment. So let me share with you what happens. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judah, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. And you know, Justin, what's fascinating to me is that they gave the right answer and then they, they went home. Like, how did they not actually go to Bethlehem to see what's going on? You know, I, I don't understand how these experts and teachers of the law, which are also known as Pharisees, could give the right answer, but then take the wrong action. Like, how did they not have at least curiosity to see what was going on? You know, I, I think back to all the Christmases growing up as a child, and I absolutely loved nativity scenes. I, I always wanted to be the shepherd. Uh, there was something about wearing your bathrobe in school, and this is back in the day when you could actually do a nativity scene in, in public schools. So I was always the shepherd and there were the sheep and there were the angels and there, were the, there was Jesus and there was Mary and Joseph and donkeys and all of that. But not one time do I remember a chief priest or teachers of the law, also known as Pharisees being present because in this most important thing, this, the thing their scriptures talked about, they missed it, they didn't even see it. And so I think it, it, it's a challenge as you think about that to say, how could the ones that were the most religious people, the ones supposedly closest to God, not know that the king had come. And I think it tells me that they weren't really looking for a king. They had it all figured out. Yeah, and as we were talking about, how did they miss it? Like, how did they miss this moment that they planned to lead through, this moment that they planned to experience? Uh, I wonder, for me, how do I miss it? There's a little bit of the story, and we're gonna talk more about this, but like, how do I miss the moment that is right in front of me when I read this Christmas story? Like they heard that this Messiah was coming and they had this posture of, I don't need a king. And yet we see in a conversation with Jesus, even years later, that they still had this heart posture that kept them back from experiencing what God might have for them. To miss out on the, the moment of curiosity to see if Jesus is who he really said he was. Let's look at it in John. It says this, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, and the father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have heard you have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you will have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So these religious leaders have their minds made up about what God might look like, that it holds them back to even considering that Jesus may be the God that they looked for, the Messiah that they had always hoped for. Yeah, and you know, those words are very haunting that you could actually study these scriptures diligently, you know, thinking that there's where all the answers are. And yet at the end of the day, you never once heard the voice of God. You really didn't understand what God was up to. You know, I think they're, as you said, their own, it was their own beliefs and their own convictions. And I would really say their dogma and their certainty that became their home. That was their place of comfort that's what they were accustomed to, that's what they were used to. And so then when something new was coming, something that didn't quite fit their, their paradigm, that they couldn't see it, they couldn't hear it, their hearts were closed off to it. They were absolutely certain that they had all the answers. And so when the King of King comes, when the Lord of the universe comes into his world and they could quote the right scripture and point the Magi to Bethlehem, they had no interest or curiosity themselves to go see what God was up to. And you know, I, I, think, I think beyond that, there probably was a part of them that said, there's no way these foreigners, you know, these Gentiles, they're not part of our religion, are going to have answers that we don't have. And so they had no curiosity, no openness. Their hearts, their hearts were hard, their minds were made up. Yeah, and we talked about the barriers that they built in their lives, these comforts and certainty. They built these barriers around their lifestyle that stopped them 
uh, from hearing God trying to break through and, and give them a new vision, a new hope, uh, and a new possibility of life. And, and it kept them blocked from being even curious about this story, about this moment that was unfolding. And for me, when I find myself in the story, when I find myself in their lives, I ask the question of what are my barriers? Especially in a season with all the chaos that we're experiencing in our family, we have a family uh, with four kids, we have virtual school going on. My natural desire is survival. Like I have to make sure that they get their virtual school meetings, that I make my meetings, that we get all the tasks done. And I wonder if I too often build barriers in my life that stop me from hearing God, that I'm not present in a moment where his voice can break through, where I have kind of established the barriers of a checklist that need to be accomplished every single day that doesn't allow me to be even interrupted. And when we look at the story of these religious leaders, they were unwilling because of the barriers that they established in their life to go six miles to discover if this story was true. Hmm. And I wonder in my life, do I have 60 seconds in the middle of my day where I am allowing God to break through the schedule, the activity, my plans, and hear his voice and what might be on the other side that he is offering? What hope, what possibility? Am I even curious to what he is offering? You know, when you talk about six miles, it, it makes me think, that God came all the way from heaven to earth and the ones that should have known better, the ones that should have known him the most, they were the Bible experts of their day, couldn't make that short journey uh, to see what, what God was up to. You know, I had a mentor uh, a number of years ago that told me, don't be too hard on the Pharisees. And, and I thought it was the strangest thing because like the Pharisees, were, they were just bad. But he's, he actually challenged me even more. He said, when you read the gospels and you come across the Pharisees, rather than judge them, Take a few minutes to see where you might actually in your own life relate to them. And as I began to do that, reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and seeing, seeing the Pharisees, I realized that there was a lot of that inside of me. And, and primarily in my case, it was terms of uh, knowledge. I studied the Bible hard. I, I would win any Bible trivia uh, quiz when I was young. I knew all the books of the Bible in order. I could rattle them off. And over time, as I went and got education, I think I got more certain about everything that I believed, that I was right in anything anybody else said that was contrary to that, they were wrong and it built this barrier, this wall, this dogma in my life and I wasn't open to the fact that maybe there was more about God. Like maybe Craig Mays had not totally figured out the God of the universe, that he was much more expansive and, and maybe in some ways unknowable and I would be more curious about trying to understand who this God actually was. So when I, when I look at this story and I see what they missed, I mean that they walked away from the most important event in all of human history, I, I think I need to pause for a moment and take a look at my own heart and say, where, where am I no longer open? Where am I no longer humble and teachable to wonder what God is up to? Could I find myself in that position where my mind is so made up, that I have so much certainty that I have zero humility and curiosity to hear what God might be doing? And so I think at this Christmas time, the season for all of us, are we willing to open our hearts are we willing to open our minds? Are we willing to consider that God might be doing a new thing and that we are listening to him? And maybe, just maybe, he's inviting us to take that journey today to Bethlehem. Thanks so much, Craig and Justin. And before we get to the final characters in this story, we also want to mention that in these kits, these Christmas kits that all of us should have received, there's actually makings for a Christmas star. And we have directions as well, but for those of you who don't feel like you need directions, it should look something like this. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this is a work of art, right? And Joel and myself, we both made them. What did you, you look like? You follow directions, I didn't. My, I mean, look at this comparison. Yours looks better. <laughs> Mine looks as like, it's like falling over. <laughs> and so we'd love for you to join us. If you could actually do better than us, which is gonna be hard, we'd love for you to make a star and actually take a picture and post it on social media with the hashtag Christmas at Kens Kensington. We'd love to see what you come up with. So we've been looking at different people's responses and attitudes toward this Christ child, this baby that was born. Uh, we looked at Herod. And Herod, he thought he was the king. He didn't wanna recognize a new king. He didn't wanna lose his power or his position or his control. We also looked at the religious leaders who really liked the way things were. They benefited from the way things were. They, they were stuck in a sense of uh, apathy. And so they didn't want to accept this Jesus. But we're gonna look at a third group of people. And this is really fascinating to me. We're gonna look at the Magi. 
Yeah, and the Magi, they were an incredible group of people. And as was mentioned earlier, they were priests and kingmakers, which meant that they had a lot of power and influence. And they had been traveling for almost two years trying to find this child whose star they had seen. And they had finally found him. And the thing with the Magi were, was that this wasn't their first rodeo because they, were, they had been in the presence of royalty. They had crowned kings before. This is what they did. And so when they finally saw Jesus, they could have just very easily gone in, crowned him as king, given him his gifts, and just been on their way. And as you can imagine, after almost two years of being away from home, they probably wanted to get home and sleep in their own beds and see their family and their friends again. But they didn't. Their response was different because they understood that Jesus was a different type of king. He was the king of kings. And Matthew, in his gospel, actually tells us about their response. And he writes, when they saw the star, meaning when the Magi saw this star that was over the place where Jesus was, Matthew tells us that their response wasn't, meh, you know what, been there, done that, he's just a regular king. No, he doesn't say that, but rather he tells us that the response of the Magi was that they were overjoyed. And the type of joy that he's talking about isn't the type of joy we experience when we get that last piece of pie on, at Christmas dinner, as great as that is. But the type of joy he's talking about is a massive, overwhelming, overflowing joy. It's like the type of joy we'd experience if the Lions won the Super Bowl. And we both know that would be like an otherworldly event, right? Not happening. <laughs> not gonna happen, exactly, right? It's, it would be like a once in a lifetime event if that happened. And so, but that's the type of joy that he's talking about. And Matthew continues on by telling us that on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And that when these magi saw Jesus, their immediate response was to worship him. And the Greek word that Matthew uses for worship there indicates that they fell to their knees and they bowed deeply, so deeply that their foreheads would have touched the ground. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wow, I'm really good at this, right? That's what you're thinking, right? I'm like a professional bower. And the thing is, is because this is, I did this growing up in that every new year, I would go over to my grandmother's house and I would do exactly this. And it's because it's a Korean tradition called tsebe. And it's a way of conferring honor to one's elders. And don't get me wrong, there was a little bit something in it for me as well, because afterwards my grandmother would give me a little bit of something, something. But with the Magi, they didn't bow to Jesus for money, or even to confer honor to an elder or just any king. But rather, they did this because they wanted to worship the greatest king the world had ever known and would ever know. And so the response of the Magi was very different than that of Herod and the religious leaders in that their response was joyful, exuberant, extraordinary worship because they recognized that Jesus was the king. That's so good, worship. There's another part of this story that I love too. I mean, we've talked about the response of Herod and the religious leaders and how the Magi responded so differently. But there's another part of their response that I find so incredibly fascinating. And it's really, really easy to overlook. And it's found in verse 12. This is what it says. It says, later they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. And they went back home by another road. I mean, God, God spoke to their subconscious. He spoke in their dream and he told them not to go back, not to go back to Herod, not to go back in the same way that they came. They didn't go back to Herod. They didn't go get paid because they anointed another king. There's a shift that takes place in the story. They leave the story and they go back, somehow change from when they came. This isn't just another baby. This isn't just another king. This is the God of the universe entering into creation in the most revealing way. This caused them to change the trajectory of their life. And this is what happens when, when they experienced Jesus is they, they couldn't leave in the same way. And, and maybe this tells us something about the way home that we've been talking about. Maybe this tells us that the way home isn't the way back. Like, what I mean is when you, when you encounter Jesus, you don't leave in the same way. I remember when I was in college, uh, I experienced this in an incredibly real way. I was in Myrtle Beach on spring break and I was walking the beach, I was depressed and I was just praying like, Lord, I need you. And he did something in my heart. And when I came back from Myrtle Beach, I no longer lived for myself, I no longer partied, I no, I no longer just was all about having fun. 
life got real, I found purpose, and, I, and, and it wasn't that I, I was a good person or I, I was doing anything right. I just gave my life to Jesus, and because of him, everything changed. So I wanna invite you to think about something, and maybe after the service, or maybe with your friends or your family, I want you to think about what character in the story are you? Are you Herod? You like your power position, your, your control, and so you're, you're somewhat resistant to Jesus. Uh, maybe you're a religious person, you're comfortable, you're apathetic, maybe you are benefiting from the way things currently are. Or are you one of the magi who gets down in, in this joyful worship and, and, and worships the king? And, and, and to go further, they were forever changed. They went home a different way than they came. Who are you in this story? I, I know this Christmas is different than all the other Christmases that we've had, but the questions remain the same. Do you encounter Jesus with wide eyes and an open heart? Are, are you responding like the Magi? Are you allowing this encounter with Jesus to change the trajectory of your life? Are you, are you meeting Jesus and leaving differently? Are you taking a different way home? I think that's what's so fascinating about the Magi is, is they responded differently. And I encourage and I invite you to respond differently this Christmas as well. So may you, when you encounter Jesus, may you respond in worship, and may you take a different way home. And this is why Jesus came. This is why he entered into human history, so that we could experience life, so that we could be transformed. And so today, we'd love for you to spend a few moments just contemplating these questions and also to have conversation, conversations with your family and your friends as well. We want to move into a moment that is so special here at Kensington. It is such a special tradition. And inside each of these Christmas kits are candles. And if you didn't receive one of these Christmas kits, feel free to grab other candles that are around your house. And Danny Cox is going to lead us in this next moment. The candle lighting moment is by far one of my favorite Kensington traditions we do every year because it's a tangible picture of the power of the light of Christ that draws people in and then illuminates and transforms hearts, minds, and soul one person at a time. It reminds me of a scripture written by a close friend of Jesus. His name was John, and he wrote this. In him, in Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The true light that gives light to every single human being was coming into the world. God entered into the world on that very first Christmas, bringing light and life for all people who had placed their faith and their trust in Jesus. You know, this year, just a couple days ago on December 21st, an event occurred that scientists said was pretty rare. They call it a great conjunction. Two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, passed close to each other and they created this giant light, this great light, a star. And this is the first time since March 4th, 1226, believe it or not, in the 11th century, that it was so visible. Many believe that this kind of event could have happened the very night Jesus was born, causing what we call the Bethlehem star, that star that the wise men followed. And the wise men followed that single bright light in the sky, and it guided them to the true light for all people. And when the Magi met the true light, Jesus Christ, on that first Christmas, something changed in them. So much so that when they left, they actually went a different way, disobeying the ruling powers of that time, putting their life at danger. You know, I really do believe that they left forever changed in their hearts, in their minds, and in their souls. Because when you meet Jesus Christ, the true light, you never see the same. His light permeates you, guides you into a new reality, points you on a path to a new home. You know, many years ago, when I came back to Christ, Dave Wilson was preaching, and he had a tagline in his sermon. It was, God's calling you home. And he kept saying that, God's calling you home. Come home in different forms. I don't know, maybe it was like the 10th, 11th, 12th time he said that. Something broke in me. I mean, it was something I hadn't felt in years. It was as if a floodlight came into the dark and just broke open this whole new reality. And I just started weeping. And I'll never forget, I went home that night and I stood in front of my wife, Amy, and I said, Amy, the man that left this morning is not the same man that's standing before you. And I had no idea. I couldn't even tell her what happened. I said, something happened, but I am not the same. Maybe this year, one of the most difficult and what dare I say, maybe the most darkest years in recent memories, you'll experience Christmas 
I'll experience Christmas in a different way. And I'm imagining this moment in my mind as candles are being lit in every home, in every space that all of us are gathering and listening. And the light is illuminating the environment around us. That light represents the true light, Jesus Christ, the one light that will guide you really home. Maybe this Christmas is your moment, just like it was my moment years ago. Maybe it's, this is your moment. When you say yes to that light, you will say yes to Jesus Christ, and he will create a new home in your heart. So as you hold and light this candle this year, and as we enter into singing a song, I'm praying that you will experience Jesus Christ like never before.
It sounds so beautiful. I would really love you guys to just one more time do that chorus. And for everyone that's home, I would just encourage you, let's sing this out. Let's sing these praises up to God. Let's fill our spaces. As we're singing that, I can't help but think of one image in my mind, you know, especially this year where we spent so much time in different spaces, sometimes alone and separated. But in this moment, I want you to imagine something. Millions of people, literally millions of people around the whole world in this moment are singing and holding a light of some sort. And they're proclaiming the truth of the true light entering into our world. From that one light entering in at that first Christmas, to just millions of people across the globe singing out. It makes me realize that sometimes when we're feeling alone, actually we're quite together with so many people in a family of God connected through the person of Jesus. And it happened from that very first Christmas. You know, 700 years before the birth of Jesus, there was a prophet, Isaiah. And he wrote about that moment that Jesus was going to enter in. Listen to what he said. This is Isaiah 9. It says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned. And then it says this a little bit further down. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace that will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. You know what hit me this year? I read this scripture almost every year. What hit me this year was that little section at the end, from that time on and forever. That moment when Jesus entered in, 
It was that moment that actually changed history. He came to establish a new way, a new kingdom, bringing a new light in that would be rooted in his justice and his mercy and his grace and his righteousness and his love from that moment forever. Let me pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for that moment. Thank you that you would leave your heavenly home to come close to your creation. You're not a distant God. You're a God of intimacy. You're close to us. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for that moment when you brought light to this earth so that each person that proclaims their faith in you would have access to that light. Lord, we thank you for this season, especially this year. In a time of so much struggle, so much isolation, we know, Lord, that your light, the darkness can never overtake it. And so we thank you for you doing. Lord, I pray specifically for the person that this year says yes to you for the very first time. I ask, Lord, that they have an incredible awakening and they're drawn in to who you are and who they are in you. We thank you for this moment and we pray this in Jesus' name. And we say, amen. Well, we're going to blow out our candles. And every year we say, put your hand in front of the candle. Now, for you kids, I know this for sure. No matter where you're at, you're going to have this candle lit for like the next 10 hours. But here's what we want you to do. Why don't you put your hand here? Because we know that probably your brother and sister are in front of you. When you blow this candle, you're probably going to put hot wax on them. So put your hand here and let's blow it out. Well, we want to end by singing again. And I'm going to encourage you to sing. And we sing in celebration. Did you know that on the very first Christmas, in that very first silent night, there were shepherds working out in the field and angels of God came to them. And this is what they said. The first thing they said was, do not be afraid. And then they said this, because we come with good news and great joy for all people. So we want to end this 2020 with singing out in good news and great joy for everyone. So join in. Merry Christmas. The herald angels see Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies With angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born
in excelsis Deo. Thank you guys so much for joining our online Christmas service. And we want to remind you, don't forget, next week we have a special recorded service on December 27th. So don't forget to tune in. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. All right, come on, everybody. Wherever you're at, wherever you're watching from, put your hands together. We're going to sing this song together. Go out and tell it. Tell the good news. Jesus is born.
Glory streets. 